Carnegie Mellon, and he's working on human interface. He'll be here in Austin in May. There's a conference. Mojam.com. It's awesome. I love it. So I also started um, keeping track of food consumed, and I kept track of, um, it's a microjournaling site, or whether I had an upset stomach every day, which sounds really disgusting, but it's just the idea that you can really simply microjournal something and keep track of it and start to make a change in something that you think is immovable or unchangeable in your life. So, with all these, it's the whole question of what's possible to track. Uh, there's an organization called the Quantified Self. It's a meetup group. I belonged in New York, which is where I met a lot of these people. And then I um, have gone to a few meetings in the Bay Area, which is a massive group, and went to the conferences. It's, some of it is health people. Some of it is athletes. Some of the people are just interested in personal science. They like the idea of metrics and measuring. There's a lot of software people in it. But it's an interesting kind of on, and there's a few compulsive people there. Uh, <laughs> they're the best. Uh, and so uh, my husband Mark went to the conference and said, well, how could there not be one of these in Austin? So Mark's the organizer for the Quantified Self Austin, and the first meeting is tomorrow night. So if you go to the Quantified Self and click on Austin, you can come. If you really look at tech, you know, I have a background in technology. I started as an engineer. I worked in creating new consumer products for years and years. And I can just see this coming. There's, um, there's sensors that are getting built into clothes. You can put a little patch on that keeps track of your heart rate. You know, you, you, you know if you want to track your mood, it could be, you, know, you don't have to necessarily do it yourself. It could, you know, a little facial recognition, a little bit of galvanic skin response, a little heart rate variability. You'll know if you're stressed and what your mood is. There's uh, a friend sent me a note um, here in Austin, sent me a note and said, you know, Laurie, it's exactly like my husband. He's diabetic and he really does live by those numbers. And she says there's a site um, that's researching a contact lens that has a little color that changes depending on your glucose level. So no more pricking your finger, no more stabbing yourself with little needles. You know, the idea that the saline in your eye could keep track and you can either see it or you could look at it, but anyway. Sensors will be built into everything. There's a company, um, Green Goose, that has these little sensors. They're really inexpensive. They have a little kit. I went and looked at it online today um, for your pet. You can figure out how long you go walk them. You put these little sensors on your animals. But the idea is that tr self-tracking and self-surveillance is going to be just invisible. I really think it's just going to passively you know, come into our lives. And, you know, it's either going to be, I started making a little joke here, it's either going to be invisible or very colorful. This company, eChromi, uh, they make, it's a, it's a biomedical company and they can track bacteria and turn it into color. So you swallow basically these little capsules and you can basically look at your excrement and depending on what color it is, figure out do you have an E. coli bacteria, various bacteria that you could capture, you can see what color your poop is. They were in the exhibit at MoMA, at the Talk To Me show. So, it's happening, it's coming. So as I, as I became convinced that there was this, you know, sensors are coming, they're going to be invisible, I was tracking my sleep, I've been tracking myself, and I thought, there's something going on here that's really powerful, and I thought, why? And one of the first things I found was, it's like, I love getting a sleep score in the morning. The first thing it does is it asks me, how did you sleep? And you score yourself. And it's like a mechanical mom. It's this, some, it's acknowledgement. It, it might be a machine, but there's something really powerful in having something being measured about yourself and uh, that acknowledgement. I also found there's something really awesome in this idea of personal science. You know, as I measured my upset stomach for about eight months, I finally figured it out. I mean, I finally started to understand what the connections were. And, you know, I think as you look, you know, as you meet a lot of younger people in their 20s, there's this, there's this sort of automatic expectation. If you move better, if you sleep better, if you, you know, you know if you eat better, 
you're going to feel better. It's sort of this idea of taking control of your life a little bit and thinking that all these things really are connected. And so this idea of, um, I can, you know, sort of the medical profession's not going to fix it for you. You've got to sort of take care of yourself. So personal science. You know, some people have talked to me, it's like, oh, God, I don't want to know that data. And are, you know, everybody's already tracking me already, right? Your Google search history. You know, if you take your credit card into Home Depot and go to return something, they don't even want the receipt. They just swipe your card and they know exactly what you bought, when, right? It's like, oh, man, they can know everything. And it doesn't matter which one. It could be in another city. But every bit of data about your phone and where you've been and your GPS tracks, and you start going, all right. There's a lot of data on me out there. So I thought, well, fight back. You've got data, I've got data. You know, there's a possibility you could tip it the other way. If I have more data about me than you have, you know, that you could see the balance of power potentially shifting. You think I'm crazy. <laughs> the other, the, there's five reasons. So this is number four. So this one's the idea of the other you. You know, what if you start, you know, realizing that you, you're not just measuring what you're saying about yourself, you're really watching yourself, right? So you're really measuring how many steps did I take today, right? You're really measuring how did you sleep. You're actually capturing very specific behavior. And I think, you know, your behavior sometimes is a more um, truthful part of you. So it's the other you. You know, people say, well, what do you, it's like, all right, if you, when you talk to yourself, who are you talking to? It's that other, it's the one, okay, it's the one, um, you know, after a dinner party at my house and I take the chocolate cake and I put it in the trash because the other me, the one in the morning, is going to eat it. So, right, it's, so you're bargaining with your future self. So I think you get to know this other person by tracking and watching and measuring. And finally, this last one is, is the most powerful, but it's the one that I have the hardest time articulating. But I think measurement and self-tracking, it's a sense of identity. It's who are you? Maybe it's if you measure, you exist. There's a sense of being. There's a sense, you know, maybe it's just narcissism, which I think culturally is becoming more acceptable. I think it's... <laughs> I, there, I think there is a way of... Um, not self-absorption, but it's okay to be concerned of yourself. But there's something about identity, a sense of who am I, um, the, the fact that I know this about myself. Um, it, I mean, it could be part of the reason there's so many photographs on Facebook. You know, it's a sense of who are you, just the quantity of um, information and data, you know, it's location, you know, how many people checked in when they got here, that, right? So, as I thought about identity, you know, it's like, well, what if you recorded everything? There's a guy, Gordon Bell, some people in tech would recognize. He was one of the founders of digital equipment, and he was like a chief researcher at Microsoft. And he started measuring everything about himself, I think in 99, 12 years ago, a long enough time ago that Microsoft is who funded him, because he videoed everything about himself. And so the, the size of the disk drives was unbelievable. And, but, you know, he did it at a time where it was um, less, you know, prominent. So he, he started keeping track of everything. And you start, you can go, there's links here, I'm not going to click on them. You can go in and, and take a look at his video. He's given a talk at the Quantified Self. And, and, and get a sense of, um, you know, what that kind of history looks like. You know, so I thought about that. And I thought, well, what if you, you know, could play back a version of yourself? You know, it starts to be the conundrum. How do you watch yourself if you're always recording yourself? Do you have time to, you know, it starts to be the, it's the paradox. How can you watch yourself if you're always, so I thought you could have to have a, a, um, a summarized version. You need to somehow get a shortened version. And I thought, well, what if you could start to turn some of that, you know, that you captured about yourself into some kind of pattern? What if there was a, a way to distill it? And I went back to this original idea that there's something about brain rhythm and pattern that's just primal. You know, we're, we are, as humans, um, designed for pattern recognition. We anticipate. We see patterns. We, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's anticipating, you know, when the saber-toothed tiger is going to jump out of the jungle at you. But it's the, it's the idea that you um, 
can see patterns and anticipate and recognize danger. But pattern recognition is something that's innate. And so I thought about this idea of, you know, how could you, you know, think about pattern as primal? You know, what if you could start to have this sense of identity and the sense of pattern and start to surround yourself with it? You know, what if you could live in spaces that are like ambient sensing walls, passively capturing, you know, using all these little sensors on you and play back your mood, play back your stress level, play back things that are going well, things that are not going well, and surround yourself with it. Would it be soothing? Maybe it's motivating. But at least it's reflective. It's almost like having a mirror. You know, in some ways it's like a set of mirror neurons back to yourself. Acknowledgement. And so I took this idea and I thought, well, all right, how do I take this, you know, tracking? And I wanted to get away from data visualization and graphics and put it closer on the end toward something metaphorical. Something that was more the, the idea of um, self-tracking as a language, and thought, you know, how do you know how do I even think about that? You know, there's a lot of software companies that are trying to find a way to put, you know, your DNA data with your sleep data, with what you consume, with how much you move that day, and come up with, you know, sort of a visualization of, you know, who are you, how you're doing. There's a lot of software companies working in this whole area of self-tracking and gadgets. But I think they think of it as data visualization. And I thought it might just simply be, it may come from you know, more of an artistic kind of sensibility. And so I started looking at you know, what kinds of languages, non-Western languages, and what kinds of um, examples are out there. And I, this is the point where I met Dave Stewart, who's the you know, preeminent expert in Mayan languages at UT. And you know, he explained that he's the one that cracked the Mayan code. And he figured out that there were multiple symbols for the same idea. And the reason that they had multiple symbols was that they it was for aesthetics. It was the way the glyphs looked. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. A whole language built around decisions of aesthetics. I mean, it's really foreign to us as an English, you know, there's a word's a word means something. You wouldn't make different choices based on the physical, how the type looked. But it, it also got me to look at um, Inca quipus. So this is the Incan language. It's knotted strings. It's physical. This is, these are the guys, this is Machu Picchu. These, this is, this is the language. And you know, people think of language as visual speech. But if you take it out of your head and think, well, language could be something completely else, and then I looked at, um, uh, these are amazing. These are navigational stick charts from the Marshall Islands. This is Micronesia. These are the, the thousands of little atolls that are right in Micronesia. And for thousands of years, the guys with the outrigger canoes would navigate through. These are the guys who populated all, you know, from Polynesia all across. So these guys are good, right? And these are the atolls. So if you get a couple kilometers offshore, you know, they're, they're only a couple meters high. You know, you're a couple kilometers away, they're invisible, you don't see them anymore, right? So they came up with this navigation system that was based on, not the way we think of mapping, but they did it based on the feel of the wave action as they move through the islands. And so I thought, all right, here's a whole language that's built in pattern that's capturing the feel of the waves. It's, it was it's stunning. But then you also look, there's Balinese calendar systems that have nothing to do with time. You start, so I started really looking at um, other cultures.